Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today I want to talk about this photograph, which is one of the most iconic images of the Civil War. Don't get me wrong, I use the word iconic very carefully and very sparingly, but this is one of those images that does rise up to the level of recognition partly because it's been published so many times over the last 160 years. The caption that you usually see with it mentions that there were two lieutenants, one Union, one Confederate. George Armstrong Custer is on the right, J.B. Washington on the left, and an unidentified child at Washington's feet. Well, there's quite an interesting story behind this, and I want to give you some of the details about it now. Let's start with James Barrel Washington on the left. He was connected to the most beloved family in the United States. The 23-year-old lieutenant's father, Louis William Washington, was a grandson of John Augustine Washington, the older half-brother of President George Washington. So he's American royalty. Young James Washington was a cadet at West Point when the Civil War began, and he numbered among that group of cadets who resigned to join the Confederate Army. In June of 1861, he received a lieutenant's commission in the Confederate Army and joined the staff of General Joseph E. Johnston as an aide-de-camp. Less than two months later, there was the victory at the First Battle of Bull Run. Washington was there serving Johnston as an aide-de-camp, and Johnston selected Washington to take the official battle report and captured U.S. flags to Jefferson Davis in Richmond. Accompanying James on the mission, this mission of honor, was an aide on the staff of General P.G.T. Beauregard. Now, imagine Washington, young James Washington, descended from George Washington, our first president, delivering captured U.S. Army flags and the official report of victory by the Confederate Army at Manassas. The significance of that could not have been lost on Johnston or anyone else in the Confederacy. It's easy to imagine that some saw it as an omen of ultimate success of the Southern War for Independence or the Second American Revolution. A year later, during the Peninsula Campaign, on the morning of May 31st, 1862, James Washington was captured by U.S. pickets near Seven Pines, which is in the vicinity of Richmond, as he attempted to deliver a message to Major General James Longstreet. James Washington, after he was captured, he revealed his identity to the Union pickets who captured him. And word spread quickly that a celebrity officer had been captured. Washington was hustled off to Corps headquarters in that sector of the Union line. And then from there, he was taken to the headquarters of the Army of the Potomac, Major General in charge, George B. McClellan. Now, in McClellan's camp, his headquarters camp, he had a new aide, one of George McClellan's new aides to camp. A recent addition was none other than George Armstrong Custer. He and James Washington had been acquainted at West Point, though Custer was two years ahead of him. And of course, Custer stays at West Point when the war begins. He graduates and, of course, gets his position with McClellan. Now, there is an undated letter written by Custer that talks about meeting Washington and the photograph. In this undated letter, Custer says, quote, that he heard that a Confederate officer knew him and said that he knew me and would like to see me. I went immediately to the place where he was under guard and found to my delight 
It was my West Point friend, Washington. So here they are. The two men are reunited the first time since leaving West Point near the battlefield of Seven Pines in the headquarters of George B. McClellan. Now, Custer continues, quote, after a joyous meeting and the best welcome I could give him, I left and went to General McClellan to ask to his being put on parole that he might afterwards become my guest. The request was granted, and I hastened back to tell Washington and invite him to my tent. I entertained him for some days, and we had so much of interest to tell each other. End quote. Custer added, quote, during the stay, we talked over the different engagements, the prospects of the future, and found time to recall those halcyon days at West Point, end quote. In that same letter, Custer recounts how he and James came to sit for this portrait. Custer noted that the army was laying quiet, which is an indication that the immediacy of the Battle of Seven Pines was over. It might have been a couple days, I would imagine, maybe early June of 1862 when this photograph was made. And according to Custer, a strolling artist came through camp taking photographs. And Custer says, Washington and I thought we would sit together for a picture, end quote. Custer also mentions how the child came to pose with them. And before I read this quote, Custer refers to the child as contraband. You students of the Civil War know that a contraband is the name for an escaped enslaved person or a displaced person by the movements of the armies in that period where their legal status was trying to be determined or before the Emancipation Proclamation, or before laws that allowed men of color to join the Union Army. So we're in sort of an odd place. Contraband was the term that was being used. So let me read the passage to you from Custer's undated letter. He says, quote, As we took our places, Washington called a little contraband who stood with open mouth gazing at the camera to come to him and said to me, Custer, suppose we make him one of the group and it would be the thing, wouldn't it, to put him nearest me, laying stress on the words to indicate his pronounced opinions on the rights of the South to claim the Negro, end quote. Custer says he laughed. I suppose so, he replied to James. The Custer account does not name the artist responsible for the photographs. But a Library of Congress negative is credited to a photographer named James F. Gibson. He roamed the camps in the wake of Seven Pines and, in fact, during the Peninsula Campaign. There's a number of surviving photographs, both single images and stereo cards that are imprinted with the names of Gibson and Alexander Gardner on the mounts. These two men, Gibson and Gardner, worked together, and both of these men worked ultimately for Matthew Brady and his team of photographers. Now, let's go to New York, where Matthew Brady displayed a selection of war images in an exhibit for the public documenting the movements and the soldiers of the Army of the Potomac from Bull Run through the Peninsula Campaign at his gallery. This is in the summer of 1862. There's photographs of various scenes and generals and their staffs, all available for sale to visitors. It's unclear whether or not this image of Washington and Custer was included in the Brady exhibit. But a copy, we know a copy made its way to London as part of a large group of Brady images were sent overseas. In fact, the Times of London, in its August 30th, 1862 issue, features a commentary titled American Photographs, and it offers a look at war photography in the United States. There's no photographs reproduced in the article. It's only text. 
And the narrative has two parts. The first part is an overview of war photography in England, France, and America. The second and more relevant section to this story is a review and critique of Brady's Peninsula campaign scenes and portraits. The essay says, quote, the most agreeable subject in the volume, perhaps, is one of a Confederate lieutenant of the Washington family and name who was taken prisoner, sitting beside his college friend and relation, Captain Custis of the United States Army. They got the name wrong. Custer is not a household word in 1862. The review continues. While a Negro boy, barefooted, with hands clasped, is at the feet and between the knees of his master with an expression of profound grief on his shining face. The Confederate, in his coarse gray uniform, sits up erect with a fighting bulldog face and head. The Federal, a fair-haired, thoughtful-looking man, looks much more like a prisoner. The most terrible cause of the war, who appears to think only of his master, is suggestive enough. That Times reviewer grasped the dual narrative. The photograph tells the story of two classmates divided by war. It also tells the story of the moral conflict and the politics of slavery behind the war. Washington wanted us to know that. If the story that Custer told is true, it was Washington who wanted to make sure that the boy, the young child, was seated there to represent slavery. The reviewer assumed the child was an enslaved boy owned by James. That's not true. We don't know how the child got there. And to my research, there's no, there's no connection between the two, only that he happened to be in camp. So it's understandable that the reviewer in London would think that the two were related. No reason to doubt Custer's statement that the child was a contraband in camp with no direct connection to James. Aside from the presumption, the reviewer accurately interprets James's intent, and James succeeded in communicating to the reviewer that, in his view, slavery was an underlying cause of the Civil War. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.